So I'm going to talk about cognitive and neurobiological processes in behavioral regulation and change. We had a short phone call for our section of this symposium to try to organize our thoughts as a group. And one thing that I was asked to do to lead this off is try to define what neuroeconomics is. So I'm a professor of neuroeconomics. This is in some sense, well, in every sense, a made up term. It's a label. Combines neuroscience and economics. That's pretty obvious. What exactly that means is an excellent question. And after having agreed to give a definition of this, I thought, hmm, this is much harder than I thought it would be. So I will do a bit of hand waving, but I think try to give you a general idea that this is really just a multidisciplinary agglomeration of many different scientific fields. It's thought to sit primarily at the intersection of neuroscience, economics, and psychology, although there's a lot of input from statistics, computer science, physics, and other areas as well. So it's inherently a multidisciplinary organization, so to say. And I think the organizing label is the key contribution of this. It gets people who are interested in an overlapping topic in the same room, talking to each other, and trying to make progress going forward, much like we're doing today, but pulling from many different areas of science. The overlapping question that interests all these fields is how do we learn and make decisions, either at the level of behavior, the brain, or spanning those levels? So how can neuroeconomics help us understand what neurobiology of behavior sorry, understand the neurobiology of behavior and what drives individual choices, which is what our session is about today. So I think one important aspect of neuroeconomics is that it's focused on incentive-compatible choices. If we want to understand individual choices, obviously we look at choices, but one of the inputs from economics into this uh, neuroeconomics field is whenever possible, make these real, incentive-compatible choices. Today, I'm going to talk a lot about choosing foods. Whenever we do that, these are not hypothetical choices. These are choices where people are actually going to get that food reward, so it matters. Hypothetical choices are valuable, too. We can learn a lot from this. But one contribution is to make this real and therefore perhaps get a little bit closer to what's going to happen outside the lab. As I said already, it draws on insights from several disciplines to try to link behavior and neurobiology. So although neuroscience, as we heard before, is inherently a reductionist science, what we're trying to do is broaden this and say, what does the brain properties tell us about behavior as well? And we heard also about models and how they are all wrong but some of them are useful. And one contribution, I think, of neuroeconomics is to take models from many different disciplines and try to iterate them forward to make them more and more useful. Still, probably oversimplified or wrong in some ways, but more useful. So as I said, I'm going to use food choice as a relevant example of individual choices that impact our health and well-being. We saw earlier that obesity and food-related or diet-related disease is one of the biggest issues that we're facing at the moment. So let me walk you through the general setup for some of the examples that I'm going to give this morning. So several years ago, we developed a basic paradigm for having people make choices over food rewards in the lab. We have them come in. They're always hungry, so that they're motivated for these food rewards. And they begin by rating different attributes of the foods that they'll make decisions over. This would be the tastiness and the healthiness. So they'll see a bunch of food items, like the apple here. They'd give me a rating for how they view the tastiness of that food. So this is subjective and personal for that individual. Then on a separate trial, we'll show them a different food, and we show them 50 to 200 foods. They would give, in a separate block of trials, ratings for the healthiness, 
or perhaps the appetitiveness, or many different things. Today I'm going to focus on tastiness and healthiness, so we'll just think about those two attributes. And we do this in a counterbalanced way, of course, that sometimes they rate the healthiness first, sometimes the taste. This is done randomly across individuals. Once we have the ratings for all the foods, then they go into a decision session. And we show them pairs of foods and say, at the end of the experiment today, would you prefer to eat the apple or the chocolate cake? They know that one of the choices will be randomly selected, and they're actually going to eat that at the end of the session in the lab. So that's the general idea of how this is going to work for several of the different experiments I'm going to talk about. One of the examples I want to talk about is one where we don't just ask people to make choices, but we also try to focus their attention in different, onto different attributes during different blocks of choices. So every 10 trials, they would get a different instruction before they make the next 10 trials, next 10 decisions. In what we call the health block, they're told to consider the healthiness before they make their decisions on the next 10 trials. They're still free to choose whatever they want. In this original study, we never mentioned the idea of self-control or that you should eat healthy. We just said, think about the healthiness, then still choose whatever you want. Remember, you're going to eat it at the end of the study, so don't tell me you're going to eat broccoli if you don't want to eat broccoli. Other times, we'd ask them to think about the taste. And in the third condition, we just said, make decisions as you naturally would. We didn't give them any additional information here, and we tried to minimize the demand effect that they should eat healthy. So this is different from calorie information or labels saying this is a good or a bad food. Just said, think about these attributes, and then decide however you want to decide. And in fact, when we debrief people after going through this study, they say that they tried to do what we said, but that it didn't actually change their behavior, they thought, and that they didn't find it any more or less difficult to think about tastiness or healthiness or choose naturally. Although they didn't think that it changed their behavior, it actually did. So in this graph here, we have binned the foods into four different categories. Those that are neither healthy nor tasty, those that are healthy, but you don't like the taste, unhealthy, but you like the taste, and healthy and tasty. The three colors tell us the different attention conditions, and we have the proportion of time they said yes, they would eat the food in that case. So in this particular study, they're not choosing between two foods, they're just saying, yes, I will eat this, or no, I won't. And what we see is that when they're thinking about taste or responding naturally, of course, if it's both healthy and tasty, they're going to say yes, they want to eat that. They're hungry, they want something to eat. And in the two conditions where they're not thinking about the healthiness or not instructed specifically to think about the healthiness, they're also going to eat it, even if it's unhealthy. These are people drawn from an undergraduate population primarily. They're not too worried about dieting. We excluded dieters, actually. These are people who just want to get something to eat because they haven't had anything for three hours before coming into our study. But if we ask them to think about the healthiness, this rate goes down to below 50%. They reject eating items that they'd like the taste of if they're unhealthy following the simple instruction. And they'll also be more likely to eat things that are healthy, but they said they don't necessarily like the taste of that. So the behavior goes in both directions here. When we look at what's going on in the brain when people make these choices, we see that if we look for the value they place on the foods, combining both the tastiness and the healthiness together into one overall value, that's reflected in these reward valuation systems that we heard about earlier. And this happens to the same degree. Now the conditions are in this grayscale, but there's no significant difference in how strongly you represent the overall value of the foods across the conditions. But what we do see is that there's greater activity here in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, regions of the brain that we know are involved in self-regulation and control, working memory, and other higher-order functions. 
These are more active during these blocks where you're supposed to think about the health before you make your choice. If we try to take the different regions that are reflecting either the overall value of the foods that are more active during the health-focused blocks, and another region that I didn't show you, but this one here, is just involved in representing, or at least it's correlated with, the healthiness rating that you gave for the foods. And we form a simplified, wrong, but hopefully useful model of how these regions are interacting we see that there are changes we can observe at the group level in how these regions interact during these choices. You see that there's modulation of the activity here in this VMPFC region, which is the one here that reflects the overall value of the foods, by these other regions during the choices. And if we then take this in silico model of how the brain is working, and we put it in lesions, or adjust how the regions are interacting with one another, we can see here that this is the degree to which the health rating influences the activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, a region that we think is important for making the choices. And we see that in here, in blue, where they are either in the taste condition or the natural condition, so they're not asked to think about healthiness specifically, there's a rather flat line in terms of how healthiness influences activity here. There's not much difference between very unhealthy and very healthy foods, as if it's not very important in driving the activity based on the simulations we do from this model that was fit to the actual brain activity of our, of our subjects. And we can see that if we take out some of the connections and interactions, we can adjust how steep this slope is giving us a little bit more insight into how this might be actually working in the brain. So this is something that we think is important, that there is connectivity and interaction between brain regions in driving our choices. We've tested this in another domain to see just how useful and important it is to understand the connectivity as opposed to local activity within brain regions in looking at behavior. So now we're switching to a different paradigm, just for a second. This is what's known as intertemporal choices. So in this case, you have a default option of receiving 25 US dollars today. And on every trial, we offer you more money at some delay in the future. In the two examples you see here, you could get $47 instead of 25 if you wait for 60 days, or on another trial, $30 if you wait for a week. When we analyze these choices, we see very similar systems involved compared to the food choices in terms of representing the overall subjective value that's again here in these ventral medial prefrontal regions of the brain. And we find that activity in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is activated when you make a choice for the delayed option over the immediate option. We can again form models of how these brain regions are responding, both locally and interacting with one another. Now it's a simpler model, there are only two regions compared to the four before, but we're using the same techniques. And if we then take the individual parameters that we fit for each individual within this model, we can predict how they will discount future rewards with 71% accuracy. But we can only do this if we use both the local activity and the interactions, the coupling at the functional level between these brain regions. We can't do this accurately if we only look at coupling or if we only look at local activity. So we need to look at these interactions in order to understand how the brain is relating to behavior. By looking at these interregional interactions, we can also get another more insight into individual differences and how different factors in the environment might influence choices. So in another study, we're again having people make choices over foods, but this time, half of our participants underwent a social and physical stressor before they made the choices. And then we again observe everyone's brain activity while they make these food choices. From everyone, regardless of whether they're in the control or the stress group, 
we record salivary cortisol and ratings of how stressed they feel. What we see is that the ratings and the cortisol measures seem to track two different sets of interactions in the brain. That there are two pathways through which stress might influence the way we make choices. When we go back to this interaction here we've been talking about in terms of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and VMPFC, we see that that is very sensitive to how stressed you report feeling. People who are more stressed have weaker interactions between these two regions. But that's not the case for people who have a high salivary cortisol response. There's no significant change as a function of cortisol in this interaction. But the opposite is true for what I'm showing you here in pink between regions in the extended amygdala and ventral striatum where we know there are a lot of glucocorticoid receptors. The connectivity between this region and the VMPFC is sensitive to how much cortisol we measure in your saliva, but not to how stressed you report feeling. So there's an association between what you perceive in terms of your stress level and how your body may be reacting to the stressor and how it's influencing your brain activity and your choices. When we look at behavior, we also see independent effects of perceived stress and cortisol on choice outcomes, both of them making you more likely to choose tasty foods, even if they're unhealthy. In addition to using the brain to try to uncover individual differences of behavior, we can also apply computational modeling techniques directly to behavior from economics and psychology. We've done some recent work using a popular form of choice modeling known as evidence accumulation models to better understand decision mechanisms. And it's shown us that there are dissociable processes that govern how much importance you place on healthiness or taste in determining the outcome, and how soon within your choice process you begin to consider those attributes. To try to give you just a quick flavor of what this means, I won't go through the, the math of the model, but the basic idea is that you start at some beginning point here, in this case it's just zero, and you move towards one, which would be choosing the left food, or minus one, choosing the right food, and you do this iteratively over time, and that passes here on the x-axis. So you move with some slope up or down towards one of these outcomes by thinking about how good is the taste, how healthy or unhealthy is this food, and then deciding, OK, the left food is better than the right, or vice versa. The novel feature to this model that we've added recently is to allow for a different onset time for thinking about the taste or the healthiness. So that's represented here in the red and the blue lines. So it may be the case that you start thinking about taste first. And if it's sufficiently high, it tastes very, very good, you might quickly decide, I want that food, before you've even considered the health. But this didn't be the case that it's always taste. That is what people initially thought, that if there is some difference in this, that it's going to be taste that comes in first, and only later we're going to start thinking about healthiness. But we've actually shown that it could be either way. That's why I have here taste sometimes in red, health in blue, or vice versa. There are some individuals who think about health before they think about taste in the populations we've measured. What we actually found is that if we go back and analyze the data that I showed you before, where you're supposed to think about healthiness in some cases, taste in others, or respond naturally before you choose, if we just do this with a logistic regression, we find that there are differences in the perceived importance you place on these attributes, both in our convenience sample of university undergrads, but also in larger populations of older adults, as well as parent-child dyads. So this attention manipulation seems to work rather well across a range of ages and individuals. 
But if we try to break down the effects into not just the importance, but the importance and the timing, we can see that there are actually significant changes in the importance you place on health, following the health cue, but the taste doesn't significantly change, which is in contrast to what we would observe from the standard regression analysis. What also changes very substantially is how quickly you start to think about healthiness. In the standard case, a positive number here means that you think about taste first. Most people are thinking about taste before health. But that time advantage disappears on average when you go and think about health following these instructions. But you can see that there is still a massive amount of individual variability. Each of those gray dots is an individual person. If we look, we also see that there are previously undetected individual differences. So 90% of the people who go through this study change either the weight or the timing of taste relative to healthiness. 64% changed the timing and one of the weights, one of the two, but only 33% change the relative timing and the relative weighting for both attributes. So there are a lot of different ways in which this health prime is influencing people's choices, and we can start to uncover that previously hidden individual variability with models that look at both choices and reaction times inside a structural process framework. We don't yet know what determines how individuals will respond to the intention cues, but I think that's an important thing to use models like this to try to uncover in the future. And just to wrap up, we also see that if we apply brain stimulation to this left DLPFC region that I've been talking about in terms of being important for self-control, we impair self-control, and it specifically changes the weighting that you place on taste and doesn't change the relative start times. So we can dissociate these two mechanisms at the neural level as well as at the behavioral level. So in the context of decision making, behavioral regulation appears to rely on functional interactions between different cortical and subcortical brain regions. If we analyze neural activity at the network level, this will help us advance our understanding of decision making more than looking at local responses in individual regions. And by using neuroimaging, we can reveal individual differences and mechanistic effects that we can't see through behavior alone. Structural models of behavior can give us insights into the actual process of decision making that we also can't observe just by looking at choice outcomes or response times without modeling the process that generated those outcomes. Okay, and uh, just a quick acknowledgement of the people who funded this work. <laughs>